Today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about English um, phonetics. And that's our introduction into phonology. So we're going to start a little bit with phonetics, like my buddy here. Um, and then we're going to, and when we, after we talk about phonetics, we're going to talk about the physiology of speech production. Because we're going to really be focusing on how people form the different sounds in language. Next class, on Thursday, we're going to talk about phonology. But right now, we're going to talk about phonetics and the distinction between the two. So phonetics really has different kinds. There are three main branches to phonetics. The first is articulatory phonetics. And that is the study of how sounds are produced. How do we make the b sound? Did anyone ever go, does anyone know anyone who's ever been to speech therapy? So whether or not you've done it, I'm not asking. But if you know someone who's gone to speech therapy or know a speech therapist, OK. One of the things that articulatory phonetics does is it teaches kids how to produce the sounds, how to make the s sound, how to make the p sound, how to make the er sound, how to make sounds that are comprehensible to other people. Very often when kids go to speech, it's not that they don't have the ideas, they don't have the language skills. What they have are problems with articulation. And that's the most common exceptionality that receives services for preschoolers and young children. So articulatory phonetics is what we're going to be focusing on today. There's also acoustic phonetics. And acoustic phonetics is a little different. What it does is it focuses on the sound waves. How many of you have seen in other courses sort of spectrograms, where you see the different sound waves and what the sound waves look like on paper? OK, that's acoustic phonetics. The focus is on how the sound waves propagate, what the different sound waves look like, how the sound waves are different for the different speech sounds. And that's an important branch of phonetics. But it's kind of beyond the scope of this class. We're not really going to be focusing on that. The last branch of phonetics is auditory phonetics. And it really is, how does your brain, how does the mind work in translating these sound waves into speech sounds? So in the textbook, when it talks about phonology, it talks about also situations in which people will misperceive what they hear based on what they see. So auditory phonetics is how the mind interprets the wave sounds, how we're able to unpack and receive the speech sounds and figure out which speech sounds we've heard. Again, our main focus is on articulatory phonetics. And that's what we're going to be focusing on today. So the three main areas, in some ways it's easy to remember, articulatory refers to articulation. It's the production, how you produce the sounds. The acoustic phonetics, well, you talk about acoustics of your stereo systems, or at least my ex-husband used to talk about his stereo system and the acoustics. And we've got to put the speaker in the right place, because this way it really maximizes the acoustics. So acoustics is looking at sound transmission. Then we've got auditory phonetics. And with auditory phonetics, we're talking about how we receive the sounds, how we interpret the sounds, what we hear. So we're going to jump right into how speech is produced. And I've got my buddy here, nameless buddy. Hi, buddy. Buddy is going to help us in understanding how speech is formed. When we think about speech, what's involved in speech? What parts of the body are important? The tongue. The tongue. What else? Brain. The brain. The lips. The teeth. What else? The brain, you've got that. One of the things that a lot of people don't think of, which is important in the first part in speech, is it's below the neck. It's your breathing. 
and there are changes in the breathing cycle. Let's give a little example. If we have no control over the breathing cycle, okay, this is what happens with no control over the breathing cycle. That's what your speech would be like if you didn't have control over breath. Let's look at when we do have control. I'll, you get the picture. What are some of the differences you noticed between the yellow balloon and the controlled orange balloon? How did the sound differ? Well, that, that one made a sound and that one didn't. Yep, this didn't re the yellow balloon, the one that I just let go, didn't make much of a sound. It kind of made a and then it kind of faded away very quickly. It was a big burst and kind of dis dissipated, and it was fast. How about with the orange balloon, the one that I made annoying but I control by controlling the release of air? How was the sound different? There was a clear pitch. The sound was louder and there was a clear pitch. What else did you notice about the sound? How about the duration of the sound? It was a lot longer. The only reason why it stopped was because I just let the rest of the air out. I didn't make it go through the entire time. I didn't want to torture you. But it, by being able to control the airflow, I was able to control the duration of the sound so that the sound went longer. What else did you notice about the sound? How about the pitch? Was the pitch all over the place, or was it consistent? It was pretty consistent. And again, by controlling the airflow, I was able to control the pitch and the consistency of the pitch. One of the reasons why children sometimes receive speech services is that they have to learn to control the airflow. They have to learn to be able to control the volume. They have to learn how to control the pitch. So articulatory phonetics is really important and that the speech therapists have to understand how to control airflow. Now we're going to do a little experiment with you guys. And no, I'm not texting anyone. I'm going to put on the timer. So zero oh. for 20 seconds. What I want you to do is look at a partner. Each person get a partner, and you can be in groups of three. And I want you to put one hand on your chest. And I want your partner to look at your hand. I'll do the same thing while I have it going. So if anyone's uncomfortable, what I want you to do is look at the hand. And I want you to count how many times you see the chest go up and down in the resting for 20 seconds. So you've all got partners? And you're looking at the hands? Ready? <laughs> Put it where you know that your chest goes up and down when you breathe. Ready? And let's see how many times you breathe, not talking, just quietly resting. Time's up. OK. So anyone want to share how many times your partner breathed? Five? OK, so we've got five. We've got five. Nine. Ten. Three, two, we've got some yogis here. <laughs> OK, so we see that there's a range as high as 10 times in 20 seconds. OK, now it's going to get a little noisy. I want one person in each of the partnerships to be talking nonstop. 
You could be reciting the lines to your favorite song or poem. You could be talking about your grocery list. But I want you to be talking nonstop for 20 seconds. Be, be grateful. Past years, I used to torture the students and make them do it for a full minute. So it's only 20 seconds, one person talking. So have you decided who's going to be talking? OK, so the person who's talking puts the hand on the chest. And I want your partner to be counting how many times you breathe while you talk. So you ready? Get set. Oh. OK, ready? The one who's talking puts your hand on your chest, so that way you, you can, the, your partner can see when you're breathing, to make it easier to see that you're breathing, and so that you're not doing any inappropriate peeking at your partner. So, <laughs> well, I don't want people being uncomfortable, so. So other than just having to talk for 20 seconds about anything random, you could talk about the letters of the alphabet, but you've got to be talking the whole time. You ready? And talk. All right, time is up. OK. Now I can turn off the volume on my phone. OK, so how many times did your partner breathe while talking? Eight times? Zero? Four? One? Maybe two? OK, so the trend that we see is that people tend to breathe less while they're talking. They're able to sustain the breath for longer while they're talking. So we see not just with the balloons, but we also see with our own experience that breathing is an important part. Regulating your breath is really critical for speech and language and speech production. And there are two things that we talk about. The first is the diaphragm. How many of you have taken theater classes or singing classes. And what's the first thing that you're told to do? <laughs> Breathe from your diaphragm. And people don't really kind of know what the diaphragm is. OK, see your lungs over here? There is, underneath your lungs, sorry, buddy. <gasps> I know, taking buddy apart. Um, underneath the lungs, there is a muscular tissue that goes across underneath your lungs. And it drops down as your lungs expand, and it slowly goes back up as you exhale. So that's one way. How many of you um, do yoga? OK, so with yoga, one of the breathing exercises you do to learn about yoga breathing is often putting your hand right underneath your rib cage so that you can feel your diaphragm dropping and feel your lungs fill with oxygen. But that's not the only way that you let air in. How many of you have seen a child take a deep breath? Say, take a deep breath. And what do they do? <gasps> and their chests pop right out. And it's the intercostal muscles, the muscles that go over here. And they lift your rib cage up. The intercostals are really important in lifting up the rib cage. And the way that they work, the rib cage kind of, you know the way a handle works on a bucket, that it kind of swings up, it doesn't go straight up. That's how the rib cage lifts up. That's why you get this sort of neat kind of motion. Gosh, I feel so inappropriate doing that in class, but oh well. So the intercostals and the diaphragm combined is what helps regulate the airflow. And when you have controlled airflow going up through the vocal tract, that's important for speech production. The next way that speech gets produced is by the airflow being modified through the larynx. So how many of you have done this as kids? Uh, or, uh, I mean, it's a lot of fun to kind of do it. But the thing is, I'm not doing anything with my mouth. I'm not doing anything nasal with my nasal passage. The only thing that I'm modifying, I'm not modifying my breathing. 
all I'm doing is by causing the vibrations to go like this. We used to do it for munchkins. I do munchkin voices going, ah, and just vibrating it. It's playing with the vocal cords. Young children love doing this because they love playing with voices and how their body works. But it's just through the larynx that you can see how it modifies airflow. There are other ways that you can modify airflow. How many of you have tried having a super low voice? What's one of the things that you do to have a super low voice? Kind of go down like this. And that also is changing the shape of the larynx and changing the airflow. What do people do when they try and hit really high notes when they're singing? Have you seen kids try and like stretch their necks through the ceiling <laughs> to get a high voice and getting into the falsetto? Again, it's trying to strength, lengthen out the larynx to change the pitch of the voice. So that's one of the ways that we modify airflow. The vocal cords are on either side of the trachea, the, the windpipe. And they change their shape. So when you're singing, you're mod modifying the shape of the vocal cords. You'll also notice that sometimes when you speak some sounds, you feel vibrations in your throats. So if you say, happy days are here again, let's all say it. And put, but, and put your fingers gently on your Adam's apples. Say, happy days are here again. Did you notice how sometimes your vocal cords, you could feel vibration in your throat and sometimes you couldn't? Vocal cords in action. Woohoo! Okay. The other thing that we have is the glottis. The glottis, right around here, right around here, is in the windpipe. And sometimes you could close your glottis. So when it's closed, you can have a stop sound. So have you ever gone say, oh, what a pretty day? With a Cockney accent, sort of. Well, I guess not a Cockney accent, but pretty. Or it's sticky. OK, those would be glottal stops, where the airflow is stopped right at the glottis. Some languages use it more than others. Then the other way that we make speech sounds is by modifying the airflow through the speech tracts. So there's a pharynx at the back of the throat, a little higher up than the vocal cords. So sounds like k and g. Those are towards the back of the mouth. Those are involving the pharynx. There's the oral cavity. How many of you have seen infants go, ah, la, la, like they're just cooing? Cooing is when they're playing with the vowels and they're making different vowel sounds, no consonants there. And all they're doing is letting the air flow, but they're changing the shape of their mouth. That's all involving the oral cavity. And there are different sounds that we make involving the oral cavity, not just vowels. And then we have the nasal cavity. Have you ever noticed when you have a cold, the mms and the buzz sound the same? I got a cold in my nose. When everything's blocked, that's because the air isn't going through the nasal cavity. And the airflow through the nasal cavity is really important in making different voices. A great way to make little kids laugh, and little kids like doing it too, is to make your voice really nasally. And you pinch your nose and you make these nasal voices. Lily Tomlin used to have a bit about operator. Again, it's playing with airflow in the nasal cavity. So speech production involves a lot more than just the mouth. The nasal cavity, the lungs, the diaphragm, basically from the diaphragm on up is important for speech production. So with acoustic phonetics, what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about how we describe the way the sounds are formed. And we're going to look at all the consonants in English. And we're going to be focusing more on American English. So one of the ways that sounds can differ is known as voicing. Some sounds, the vocal cords vibrate. Some sounds, the vocal cords do not vibrate. When the vocal cords vibrate, they're known as voiced. 
When they don't vibrate, they're known as being unvoiced. So examples of sounds to consider, say the word bath with your fingers gently on, bath. You feel a little bit in your vocal cords with the book? OK, now say path. You don't feel the same vibrations when you say path. Similarly, like sip, zip. What's vibrating? The sip or the zip? Zzz. So that, see, already you know one of the ways to describe consonants, voice versus unvoiced. And a way that you can figure it out is just having your finger on your throat. And if the vocal cords are vibrating, you know it's voiced. If they're not vibrating, they're not voiced. The next is the place of articulation. One of the ways that consonants are different than vowels is that there's some obstruction in the airflow. <coughs> so somewhere along the oral tract, the, vo the vocal tract. So with vowels like ah, e, u, there's no obstruction to the airflow. With consonants, there is. So you have some, we're going to talk about manner of articulation in a moment, but sometimes the place where the stoppage happens is in the lips. So the place of articulation might be labial, bilabial, p, b, where it's stopped altogether, or f, Again, those are involving the lips, labiodental, and that you feel the stoppage being at the lips. Even sounds like oo and er, there still is some obstruction. The blade of the tongue is blocking airflow, and airflow has to be diverted around the tongue for er, oo. So one place of articulation is bilabial. So can you think of any other sounds? The p, the b, any other sounds that involve both the lips? Mmm. Yep. Then we've got labiodental. That involves the teeth and the lips. Mm. So the f and the v sounds that tickles my lips, those would be considered labiodental. We've got the chart, and the textbook also has a chart, um, the phonetics chart. So you don't have to worry too much about copying everything down right now. I just want you to get a sense of what the different places of articulation are. And then we've got the phonetics chart, the consonant chart, in the PowerPoint and also in the textbook. So just to relax a little too much. OK, interdental. What do you think interdental means? Yep, between the teeth. I heard someone say between the teeth. I love it when people come up with the answers. So interdental is between the teeth. Can anyone think of something that's interdental? The, the f any thoughts about interdental sounds? Let's think about it. Uh-huh. That's right. And in fact, the TH sound one of the things that a lot of kindergarten teachers don't always get is that the TH makes two different sounds. It can be unvoiced, like thing, or it can be voiced like this. Young kids in kindergarten hear two different sounds, but sometimes spelling influences the way that we hear the sounds, and some kindergarten teachers don't always know that. It's not always good. OK, alveolar. Behind the teeth, that bumpy ridge right behind the teeth would be from the alveolar part of the mouth. So someone has an idea? S -s yep. And then there are also, they could be formed in other ways. So you also have, mm, let's see, let, don't forget about the sound that we could have. Da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Da-da-da-dum. Any idea about what sound might be other sound? 
That might be alveolar. D, yep, D and T. Then we have the alveopalatal, or it's sometimes referred to as just palatal. And that refers to sounds that are formed of the hard palate. Unfortunately, if I take them apart, it's too small to see. So the last slide has a pet. That big area on the back of the, uh, the mouth, the roof of the mouth, is the palate. And then we have the velar sounds at the velum, the soft palate at the back of the mouth. Oh, pa palatal sounds. Almost forgot about them. Shh. What do you think might be there? Oh, uh, let me go back. I'm sorry. I got so enthusiastic I forgot about examples for alveopalatal. The palatal is the roof of the mouth. It's where it's flatter. It's sort of like the hard top of the roof of the mouth. So anyone have an answer? Shh, let's think. Yep, the shh. ka -ching. That's another sound that involves the palate. And then we have the velar sounds, which is the soft palate, which is at the back of the mouth. Come, 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 come. Anyone have an idea? K yeah. Do I give too many hints? That's OK. And then we have the glottal. The glottal stop, yeah. So with old movies like Train Spotting, you'd hear them talk about the pretty city. I skipped the word in the middle because I want to be a lady. But that involved glottal stops. So when we describe consonants, what we want to do is we also want to talk about the manner of articulation. How do we make the sounds? We've got whether or not they're voiced or not voiced, so we know whether or not the vocal cords are vibrating. We know where the stoppage or obstruction happens in the vocal tract. The next thing that we need to do, the last thing we need, is how that obstruction takes place. And some are stops, just like or p, or t, or d, or k, or g. One of the things that you'll no notice with stop consonants is that it involves a complete blockage of the airflow. And it's a pretty, pretty much a burst of air that goes through to make it. One of the things that you'll see in interventions for young children, um, so the Linda Mood Bell program, takes these phonetic principles and teaches those principles to kids, articulatory phonetics. And one of the things they do is they teach kids about different kinds of sounds. So you've got the lip poppers, like p and b, that are stops and place of articulation. Then you've got the fricatives. And the fricatives, are the sounds that are formed kind of like the annoying noise I made with the balloon. The air flow is constricted. It's never blocked completely. And it goes continuously. So you could draw out the fricatives until your lips tickle you too much. Like It's a pretty steady state and that there's the obstructed air flow but it's never stopped completely. Then you have the affricates. And affricates are kind of fun because they start off like a stop consonant and then they release into a fricative. So ch. So ch has a very clear beginning, but you could draw out the ch. And that would be an example of an affricate. Make sense? 
Okay, I, if you have questions, please let me know. Then we have the sounds that are formed by nasals. So these are the sounds that seem to disappear when we have a cold and our noses are stuffed. So we've got mmm, mmm. If you put your finger against your nose, mmm, do you feel it? Mmm, mmm. And this sound, mmm. So the mmm sound happens at the wor at, with words where it's like sing where basically the g sound gets nasalized so that you might not actually hear the g that clearly. So you, but sing or sink, the, the nasal sound is very different. So if you have the word sink, how does it sound different than sink? Sink sounds wrong, right? But sing, where it's more at the back, is the sound that you hear in sync. Okay. Then we have the liquids. The liquids are almost vowel-like, but there still is the obstruction in the vocal tract. So that they, ooh, the air is diverted around the sides of the tongue. The tongue tends to go up, and with er, the tongue tends to curve down. But both of them are almost vowel like. And then we have the glides. And the glides, involves some sort of change in the middle. So with the w and the y. Have you noticed that I have these, all the letters in these flashes? In linguistics, the convention is if you're referring to the sound, not the letters, then you put them inside these slash marks, okay? So whenever you see me present things in these slashes, then I'm referring to the sound and not the letters themselves. That's pretty important because sometimes the letters and the sounds have very different sounds. Sometimes they overlap, but sometimes they have very different sounds. So keep in mind that whenever you see a letter inside those slashes, we're referring to the pronunciation. The other thing that I want to draw your attention to is that in the textbook, it has um, IPA, the International Phonetics Association's approach to writing, um, transcribing sounds, um, and the phonetics. I'm not using it because this really is a 10-week survey course, and I just don't think that it's as important for you to know IPA. I think it's important for you to have a good sense of phonetics and how the sounds are formed. But IPA is a fabulous tool. If you go into speech, if you go into linguistics, it's a fabulous tool, but I don't want to have to teach that to you at the expense of understanding the principles. So we're not doing IPA on purpose. OK, here are the English consonants <coughs> fully described. So what you see is that the way that, you, that the consonants are typically presented on these consonant charts is that it has the manner of articulation, it has whether they're voiced or voiceless, and then it has the place of articulation going across. So if we describe, um, let's see, the s sound, what, how would we describe the s sound? Let's get practice using the chart. For s, how would we describe it using the chart? Alveolar. It's alveolar. What else would we do to describe it? So the place of articulation is it's alveolar. It's fricative, it's fricative voiceless. Right. So let's look at the sound j, as in judge. 
How would we describe that? Okay, so j. The place of articulation? It's palatal. What kind? What's the manner of articulation? It's affricate. And is it voiceless or voiced? Okay, great. So using this method, these knowing just those three features, that's enough to describe how each of those English phonemes are pronounced. Each, and we're talking about the phonetics. So we've got, we can describe every sound in English, every consonant, just using those three features. Why is that important? Well, what do you notice, for example, with um, the p and the b in pat and bat? Are they similar? How many features are they similar? Right, so they're similar in place and they're also similar in manner. How do they vis differ? And when we think of errors in production, what do we often get confused with? The ones that are most similar to each other. We rarely confuse the p for the l. Different in place of articulation, different in manner of articulation. We don't make those kinds of mistakes. What kind of mistakes do we make? Yep, yeah, the ones that are closer together. So sometimes, <coughs> for example, now you understand why when you've got a stuffed up nose, you might mistake the mat, the m, for b, because they're both bilabial. And why the d sometimes gets confused for the m, again, because once you get rid of the nasal tracts, you've got the voice d sound left behind. So when you look at these charts, it helps explain why kids might make the mistakes that they make. How many of you have had that experience of learning another language and getting confused between the sounds that sounded pretty similar to each other? It's a pretty common thing. And the reason why is because there's so much overlap. It's going to have impact on the vibrations, the acoustics. It's going to have impact on your perception. So the auditory acoustics, uh, phonetics. But understanding this chart is something that's really important because when we get to next class, when we talk about phonology and the kinds of phonological patterns that we see in children's perceptions and children's misspellings, we're going to see how closely related they are. OK? Ready to go to vowels? OK. Vowels in opposition or in contrast to consonants, they're caused by unobstructed vibration in the vocal tract. So it's clear and free airflow. And it's formed by resonance caused by the position of the tongue, the position of the oral pharynx, and the position of the jaw. So everyone say ah. OK, now say e. How do you how does your mouth feel? Does it feel like it's in different positions? Why do you think doctors say, say, ah? Yeah, to, when the doctor wants to take a look at your throat, saying, ah, encourages your mouth to be open and have your tongue low. And so it makes it really easy to get that tongue depressor in. What would you think if the doctor said, say, ooh? 
it's like, okay, let's jam that tongue depressor in and like force your mouth open. Wouldn't work so well. There's a reason behind that sort of say, ah, the way the mouth works. And so what we have is a chart of the American English vowels. And yes, there is IPA there, but the reason why I chose this chart is primarily to show them how they're grouped together, the different sounds. And I like this chart because it had lots of examples for each sound. So how many vowel sounds do we see here? Fifteen. And what we see is that it's organized in terms of the E's and the I, A, E, A, A, U, U, O, A, A. But this is the different. The, how many of you remember seeing the schwa character in school growing up or in dictionaries? OK, so the schwa, we'll talk about it a little bit more. Um, but it's really in words like about, listen, um, tomorrow. It's the one in blue, and it's the unstressed syllable. It's the syllable that doesn't get as much play, so to speak. It's shortened, and it's that undescribed sort of generic sound. Then this little symbol refers to our controlled vowels. Have you noticed that with some vowels like bird or turn or earth? You don't hear the vowel, you just hear er. OK, well, we notice that in English phonetics that sometimes the vowel gets swallowed up by the er. And so it's become a sound in and of itself. We have the I, the owl, and the oi. So these are the vowels. And the way that they're described has to do with tongue height. So on any exams that you have, I'm going to use the dictionary symbols instead of IPA. So that the solid bar on top of a, a vowel means that it's what you call the, lao, the long form as opposed to the short. And we're going to talk about long and short in just a moment. So some vowels are high in the mouth, like E. What other sounds are high in the mouth? E. I. I ends high in the mouth. We've got some that are mid, mid mouth so that the tongue isn't all the way up. It's partly up, like eh. And then we've got some that are low, like ah. Another way of describing the tongue's position has to do with how far front it is. So we've got some where the height of the tongue is most at the front, like E, versus at the back where it's ah. Can you feel it? Say E. Now say ah. Where do you feel? Do you feel the difference in your mouth? That's part of what's so fun about this lesson is that you get to feel all the different sounds in your mouth and rediscover. I love it. <laughs> OK, another issue is lip rounding. Have you noticed that some vowels, your lips are pretty round? Which ones? <gasps> Ooh, what else? Ooh. And what has the, t the lips really spread out? Aww. Still in a kind of round way, but uh, what, do we, what, what do we tell people when we take a picture and we want them to look like they're smiling? Cheese! That's when your lips are spread a lot. So the key dimension that we talk about is how round lips are versus how spread out they are. See, now you know why we have people say these silly things when we take pictures. It makes sense. I think a linguist is behind it all. The next thing that we talk about is tenseness. And when we talk about tenseness, 
we're talking about how tense the tongue is while we're making the sounds. So for some sounds, the tongue is pretty tense. Let's look at A. How does the tongue feel? A, E, I, O. Now look at A. Ah. I, A, uh, A. Uh. Do you notice the difference in your tongue? For the first group, was your tongue relaxed? N no, it was tense. So when we talk about tenseness, we're talking about basically the long and short vowels that kids ta are taught in school. So the tense vowels tend to be the ones where there's greater tension in your tongue. And the lax vowels are the ones where your tongue is more relaxed. One of the things that's confusing and we're going to talk about on Thursday is that sometimes we find that the tense vowels are shorter in duration than the short vowels. And so it sometimes gets confusing for kids with the language that we're using to refer to long vowels versus short vowels, but sometimes the tense vowels, which we are calling, the kids are calling long, are shorter in duration than the short vowels, so, or the lax vowels. So, to help you interpret this chart, we've got the vowel chart over here. And this is where it kind of goes in your mouth, just so that you have a sense of perspective. We see that some sounds, the E, the A, like cafe, the E, like man, the A, like cat, and the La, more like the Irish La. I know, isn't it fun? If you're really good at this and you develop this understanding, then you could pick up accents really well. I'm not quite there yet, but you can see that these are all towards the front of the mouth. Meanwhile, looking at sounds that are formed at the back of the mouth, you've got the oo and the o like bow, and the o like four, and the a like got, and the a like father. So you see that those are all formed towards the back of the mouth. And what you also see is that there's variation in how high it happens in the mouth, that the tongue may be higher up or lower down. And so all those dimensions are captured within this vowel chart. Make sense? Okay. And today I'm going to end, we're going to end early because I'm still getting used to the going from three times a week to twice a week. Um, what I want you to do is to be able to see right here how the vowels are formed. So over here with ah, you'll remember that with a, ah, is that towards the front or the back? It's the back, and it's low, and it's lax. And what we see is over here is the tongue. For u, for a, uh, sorry, a, ah, it's towards, again, the back of the mouth. The tongue is higher up, and here is, again, an x ray of the tongue and its position in forming the different sounds. Similarly, with e, eh, you see. Towards the middle of the mouth is the peak of the tongue. It's towards the middle of the mouth, but it, it's still high in the mouth. You also see that the tongue is pretty rounded here. For ah, again, you see that it's lax, but that there is a little bit of rounding, so that the ah is different than the ah and that the shape of the tongue is a little different. So what I'd like you to do, since we're going to be finishing early today, is I'd like you to be able to have an understanding of how to read the different charts, to understand how the different vowels are formed. I'm happy to work with anyone individually. Uh, if you want, I'm not going anywhere. So if you have questions about the vowel formation or the consonant formation and describing them, I'm happy to spend time with you now, um, or we could all do it together. Um, and the reason why I want you to come back on Thursday with a good understanding of phonetics is we're going to be talking about phonology. 
And phonetics is a way of describing the physical features of each of the sounds. Phonology are, refers to the sounds that are meaningful in language. So if you change a sound in the word, it changes what the word means. So cat is different than bat. And by changing the k to a b, or changing cat and just dropping the k, that, it changes meaningful units of sound. And that's what changes the identity of different words. So we're going to be getting into that on Thursday's class. We're going to talk about some of the different pronunciation and spelling mistakes kids might make based on how they hear the sounds. But it's really helpful if you have a pretty solid understanding of the phonetics itself and understanding how just changing one feature of a sound may change the identity of a phoneme. Okay? Great. Thank you very much.